right. So this morning, the, the, the title of my message is Carriers of Glory. And this is just the whole message is based on a picture that God gave me. So I would like to first give the, the explanation around it. And then I will get to what God has showed me. And then we're going to do something really practical this morning. So just as an introduction to start with um, just the reason for the presence and the power of God to be among us. I want to take us right back to the book of Genesis. Um, and in the beginning, when God made man, he made man because he had a desire to, to dwell with us. God is a relational God. He wants to have relationships. So God created man and he actually had time, the Bible talks, I'll show you the scripture, it's on the board now, where he dwelled in the garden with them. And I think that must have been an amazing time where man and God could dwell together in a garden. But obviously the fall came, man sinned and sin cannot be in the presence of God. So there was a separation between God and man at that point. I'm not actually going to read the scripture right now. You can go and read it on your own. But this is just showing how God dwelt with man. And then obviously the moment that he, they sinned, when God called to Adam, um, the first thing that Adam did is they went and they hid themselves. So it's this separation, this thing of, I cannot be in the presence of God because of their sinful state that they were in. But from that moment, God's desire was to reconcile, to fix that relationship. And God already in the garden, he told them there's going to come a time when he will put a plan and action to reconcile this, re this relationship. I can't go into detail with that now. We don't have time to do that. But God's desire was still to dwell among his people. And we start to see this if we look at the journey of Israel in the, in the desert on their way to the promised land. And even as God revealed himself to people like um, um, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as their God and the desire to be able to fellowship with them. And as the Israelites at that stage was God's people, it was his chosen nation, as they were dwelling through the desert, there came a time when Moses would go up to the mountain and he would have time with God. And he would be in the presence of God, so much so that when he came down, they had to cover his face because the glory of God just actually reflected and shone from his face. And, um, but the people were too scared. The people didn't want to do that. <laughs> Even when God spoke to them, they were like, no, please tell God not to speak to us. We're scared. Um, and it's all because of the sinful nature that they find themselves in. So God again made a plan. And we see that in execution. Exodus 29 is the purpose of the tabernacle. So what happened is God came to Moses and he gave him very, very detailed instructions of how to build a tabernacle where he could come and dwell in. Right, so we'll get to that detail in a moment because there's always good reason for detail when it comes to the word of God. But, but this is basically the purpose of that tabernacle. You find in Exodus 29, and I've got verse 43, and then 45 and 46 on here. Um, this is, I like the Amplified, so I'm sorry, you're going to have to bear with all my little brackets and stuff there. So it says, there I will meet with the Israelites. This is now in the tabernacle. There I will meet with the Israelites. And the tent of meeting shall be sanctified by my glory. And then the Amplified Bible, Bible puts a word there that they call the Shekinah or God's visible presence. So I'll come back to that just now. And I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. And they shall know from personal experience that I am the Lord their God who brought them forth out of the land of Egypt that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So if I read this, I just see that desire of God again to dwell among his people. And he says, I want to have a relationship. He says, from personal experience, he didn't want the Israelites just to hear about God because Moses said so. He wanted to dwell among his people. But there's a problem because there's sin in Israel, sin in the world, 
and God is holy. So what he does is he creates this tabernacle and his glory sanctifies the tabernacle. So God can be in that place. And when the people comes to God in that tent of meeting, they have to go through rituals to sanctify themselves and have uh, offerings and stuff to be able to clean them from their sins. But then they could come in and they could meet with God in the tabernacle. So God gave Moses very specific instructions. And after following all these instructions, we see this in amazing event or happening or encounter in Exodus 40, verse 34 and 35. And he says again, then the cloud, and then it says, this cloud is the same as that glory that was spoken about in the previous script, uh, piece that I wrote. The Shekinah, God's visible presence, covered the tent of the meeting. So after they've done everything that they were supposed to do, God's visible presence covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud remained upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So we see this amazing thing where God now comes and he sort of inhabits that tabernacle and he says, I will now, I will now make my dwelling place here among you. But you can't come in at that point if you are not sanctified, clean, purified. You can't go into the presence of God. So that was still a restriction. That was still a, one thing that separated them from actually experiencing that presence. They had to go through all these rituals first before they could do that. If I look at Shekinah presence, I quickly looked that up. The word Shekinah is a Hebrew word, which means dwelling or settling. And in a biblical sense, it represents or means the presence of God dwelling or settling over you. So that's what the Shekinah presence or the glory, Shekinah glory means. It's just God dwelling among us. Right. Then this whole thing about, I was speaking about the, the detail that went into preparing this tabernacle. And I was, I was just meditating on all these little bits and pieces because he would tell them exactly what color, what material they have to use, what they have to make each furniture piece that's in the tabernacle, how they must make it and what it should look like, the material that they must use, where they have to place it. It's like really, really detailed. It's not just the question of make a tent and put some chairs in it so that the people can sit. So, um, the first thing that was interesting to me about this whole process is the first thing God asks is an offering from the people. So, the people had to bring gifts so that they can build the tabernacle with the material that they could gather from the people. But it's interesting that the first step is basically, I almost want to say a surrender from the people that say, okay, I'm, I, I want this, I want to give, I'm offering and then also not just things, but people had to offer their skills and their service. They had to make themselves available in this process. I'm going to read a few scriptures. Uh, it's a little bit, um, it's all from Exodus 35 and then Exodus 36, but I've got the verse number next to um, each one of those bullets so that you can see which verse it is because it's a little bit hopping around. But... For instance, I'm just trying to illustrate this point. So um, verse 5, it says um, of Exodus 35, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing and generous heart, let him bring the Lord's offering, gold, silver, and bronze. So I just quickly want to pause there. Just look at that word, willing and generous. And as I read on, see how many times you actually see that coming to the front. Then verse 10, it also says, And let every able and wise-hearted man among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded. So that the one, the one is gifts, the other one is skills. Verse 21, And they came, each one whose heart stirred him up and whose spirit made him willing and brought the Lord's offering to be used for the new tent of meeting, for all its service and the holy garments. Then in verse 29, 
The Israelites brought a free will offering to the Lord. All the men and women whose hearts made them willing and moved them to bring anything for any of the work which the Lord has commanded by Moses to be done. And 35, he has filled them with wisdom of heart. I just love this. I just want to pause quickly. I love the scripture. Because if you ever say, but I'm not that good, or I'm not, you know, that skilled, or I'm not really sure, you know, if I can do this thing, then this scripture just, that just blows my mind. And he says, he has filled them with wisdom of heart and ability to do all manner of craftsmanship, of the engraver, engraver of the skillful workman, of the embroiderer in blue, purple, and scarlet, and in fine linen, and of the weaver, even of those who do or design any skilled work. And we see God enables his people to be able to do the things that he wants them to do. And that sort of counters any argument of, but I cannot. <laughs> or I'm not that good. You know, that person is a lot better. That one prays really, really nice. I can't pray like that. I can't be an intercessor. I don't have that skill. Can't work with children because, you know, I've never worked with children before. I'm not a teacher. How am I supposed to work with the children? And so on and so on. So, and here God comes and he says, if you have a willing heart, if you bring your willing heart, I will give you the ability. All right, so let's grab that. I'm, I'm dreaming here for a, for a church full of skillful and willing hearts that works. <laughs> and then in Exodus 36, verse 5 to 7, it just blows my mind because he says, And they say to Moses, the people bring much more than enough for doing the work which the Lord commanded to do. So Moses commanded, and it was proclaimed in all the camp, let no man or woman do anything more for the sanctuary offering. So the people were restrained from bringing. It's like me telling you, can you please stop giving to the church? We have enough now. <laughs> I don't know what to do with anything anymore. That's how much, and everything that they brought was from a willing heart. Nobody felt compelled. Because God stirred. God was the one that stirred that heart. So, for the stuff they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. All right, so that was a little bit of a side tangent, just for a, for a bonus. <laughs> so, grab it. But why so specific? Why is the tabernacle designed that specific? Now, um, one thing that always grabs my attention is when I see something in the Old Testament and then I see it in Revelation, then I know, whoa, here's something important that goes right through. Because there's some stuff that stopped at the cross, but there's some stuff that I see reflected on both sides that goes right through the cross for a good reason. And um, so, so maybe this will interest or spark your... Yeah interest as well. Revelation 11 verse 19. It says, then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings and noises and thunderings and earthquakes and a great hail. But suddenly this temple appears in, in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, in the heaven, we see the temple and we see the, the ark of his covenant. And I realized that when God does stuff on earth, he wants to bring the kingdom of heaven onto earth. And every single thing that you see in the temple, I wish I had more time. I told Kubis, this, this message is like a rabbit hole. <laughs> I see like the lamp. And then I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. That lamp was in the temple. And what, you know? So you can, really, you can really talk for a very long time, but I'll restrain myself. The point is... Yeah, <laughs> the things that you see in the temple, you see in, in Revelation again. It's like it pops up, not necessarily described as it is in the temple, but you, you read about the, the, the bowl of offering, but it represents something. And you read about, okay, there I'm going, let me stop right there. So, so why so specific? Because God wants to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. He wants to reflect what he has in heaven. He wants to reflect it on earth. Um, yeah, so, so God wanted that tabernacle, tabernacle to represent 
the heaven and he wanted significant symbols in there that would that would point towards the messiah it will point towards god's ultimate plan for us but here's another interesting thing later in revelation at the end suddenly the temple is gone and i'm like oh this is fascinating so let's have a look at that so in Revelation 21, verse 22 to 24, he says, But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in the light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. So here, suddenly in Revelations 21, the temple is gone. And I, I meditated that and I realized the tabernacle or the temple was to have a dwelling place where we could meet with God. And here in Revelation 21, we are all reunited with Christ in heaven. And that is the dwelling place. So we don't need a dwelling place anymore because we dwell with Christ at the end. So we are all reunited at that point. To come back to that temple, um, when Joshua, Joshua also needed to build a temple after they took in the, the promised land. And God showed him something very interesting because he told him, you are going to build my temple, but this is actually not my temple. So I want to take you to Zechariah 6, verse 12 to 13. He says, Then say to Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, look, keep in sight and watch. A man, and this man that they're referring to is the Messiah, whose name is Branch, for he shall, he shall branch out from, this, from his place, which is Israel, the Davidic line, and he shall build the ultimate temple of the Lord. He says, you're going to build this temple, but there's coming a man, the Messiah is coming, and he is going to build the ultimate temple. And then he says, yes, you are to build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the ultimate temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the honor and majesty as the only begotten of the Father, and sit and rule on his throne. And he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between the two officers, priest and king. So he says, so here, Jesus is to come, build the ultimate temple, which I guess you know already what that is, but I'm getting there. He is to build the ultimate temple, and he is to reign over that temple as both king, the ruler, and priest, the one who mediates for our sins. And then, in case you didn't get this, I've got 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 on there, just to make sure you get it. That says, do you not know that your body is a temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, whom you've received as a gift from God? You are not your own. And here God starts, and when he, when he speaks to Peter as well, he says, on this rock I will build my church. And Jesus comes and he builds the ultimate temple, which is all of us as his people, being the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. So I want to share to you what led to this message and what God showed me. So while I was praying, I saw the tabernacle, and I saw the tabernacle filled with a cloud, and the glory of God was in the place. And I saw that this tabernacle was the church. But the people were inside the church. Because you see the difference between when Moses had a tabernacle and where we are now. We've already been made righteous. We've already been cleansed of our sin because of the sacrifice that Jesus has given. And because of that reason, we can be in that cloud, we can be in the presence without having to go through a whole number of rituals. And I saw that we were in this cloud, in the, in the church, um, but then I saw the people left. So as they left the meeting, 
they each grabbed a bundle, a handful of cloud, and you walked out with a cloud to wherever you go. Because you are the temple of, the, of God, you carry his presence, you carry his glory, and where you go, you become God dwelling among the people, and you are the one that can show them God's presence. You are the one that can give them the answers because you carry the glory with you as you go. And this is how God's king kingdom come to earth. It's through you. So God's desire has always been to dwell with us. And where God is, his glory is made manifest. So before I want to carry on, if, if you can make sure that the sound is on before you go to the next slide. Because what I want you to listen to now is a prophetic word from Andre when he, when he was here, specifically for the men. Okay? He includes everybody, but he says specific for the men. And seeing that it's Father's Day, I thought it was fitting to play it again. And then I want to, to actually, at the end of the service, I want to, I want to prophetically speak over the men. So... If you read it, men, I, I sense a word for, for many of us here, uh, but for the men especially also to, I, I feel God wants in your industry, in your environment to impact, impact others. I feel in my spirit that the Lord is, is, guys, we can't sell out for career. You, you, you don't have your job just for the money. You have your job to impact people. You need to discover the higher call in your work environment. And that's going to unlock another dimension of God's grace. Live to impact others for Jesus. And you're going to see the hand of God. I actually feel in the Spirit of the Lord say, I'm going to bless you. He's actually going to give you the desires of your heart in terms of your work, your career, and all those other things. But that verse, seek first the kingdom and His righteousness and other things will be added. Seek first the kingdom, then seek self first. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. All right. Praise God. I think was that the last one? <laughs> so if we are carriers of God's glory, then you are not in your workplace, as he said, to make money. You are to bring God's presence into that place. And if you seek the kingdom of God, it's amazing. And that's not why we do it. Just hear me right. That's not the motivation. We don't, we don't seek the kingdom of God so that we can get the stuff. That's just all, that's all the wrong way around. We seek, the, we seek God's presence and we, we seek the kingdom of God so that we can see heaven come to earth in the place where I'm working. And in my family and between my friends and wherever you go. So I actually want to, because it's Father's Day, Father's Day is not just for physical fathers, it's for spiritual fathers as well. So I want the men just to stand for a moment, because I just want to, to speak this prophetically over you, that you will be carriers of God's glory into your workplace, that your priority for going to work will shift from making money and building a career to building God's kingdom. And then... We're going to trust God that as he prophesied as well, that you're going to see God's provision in abundance because of your obedience. All right? So guys, are you ready to receive that? Amen. So I just want to open your hands. Father God, we thank you that you have called us for a higher purpose. Lord, we are not just on this earth to make money and then to die. We are here for a higher purpose. Father, and each one of these men, Father, I pray that they will be carriers of your glory into their workplace, into their family, into their social circles, Lord. Yes. That they will start to shift even the atmosphere in their work as they enter that place because they carry your glory. Father, I pray that you will show to them the higher purpose that they have in their job. Father, I pray for a shift in priority to shift from career building to building God's kingdom in Jesus' name. 
And we thank you, Father, that we can expectantly hold on to your promise that you will provide, that we are not dependent on the job for the provision, that you are our provider, Lord, in Jesus' name, but that you will use each one of these men mightily to be able to bring your glory into places where people would never see it because they won't come to church, so we're going to take church to them. We're going to take God's glory and his presence and his power to them. So I just want to yeah, just pray for a fresh impartation of your Holy Spirit in their lives to enable them to do exactly that, Lord, in Jesus' name. And the men said, Amen. Amen. Before you sit down, hello. Thank you. Before the men sit down, I just want to say something. If you can just close your eyes. I just believe God is um, placing within you or has placed in you everything that you need to fulfill his purpose. At this time, he will ignite your heart. He will remove that heart that is not for him, that, heart, that distracted heart, and he's replacing it with a heart that is for him. He's renewing his spirit within you and he's placed his power within you to walk not by the flesh but by the spirit. Mm -hmm. And I believe as you go from this place and even as Loretta's prayed that God will fill your mouth and your mind with those things that are pleasing to him. That you will be in your work and you will see things from a different view. That you will see things from a different angle. And God's going to reveal to you how to bring his glory into your workplace. And that by the spirit of the Lord that you will have wisdom. And that people will not just see you but they will see the God whom you serve. And understand that you are walking by his anointing. That is not your skill or your training that is bringing you to this place. But it is God that is enabling you to move in that area. So, Father, I thank you for a divine realignment of every man, Father God. Even those that are still studying, Father God. That, that you align them, Father God, for your purposes and your plans. Father God, that we will see your kingdom come in every sphere of life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for your anointing on these men here today and even those that will be listening. Father God, that you will touch their lives Amen. and that, Lord God, that they will walk by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. You can sit down. Then I quickly want to ask one other thing. Who is trusting God for a job? You don't have a job yet. You're trusting God for a job. Or you're trusting God for a new job for whatever reason. Okay, if that's you, quickly stand up. Okay. So, so we've got an understanding now that it's not, about, it's not about the job. It's about where God wants to place you. And to not have a job or to be restricted in the, in, in, in the higher calling that has, God has for you um, is not God's will for you. So I'm going to... I'm, we're going to trust God for a job for you. Can we put a timeline on it? <laughs> Is that publicly accurate? <laughs> but that God's going to give you a job within a very short time where you can live out your higher calling and put you in the right place where you are supposed to make a difference. Right, let's pray. Just... Yeah, so if you're around them, if you can just put your hand on a shoulder or something, stretch out your hands to them. So Father God, we thank you that you have a place of impact for each of these people. Father, I pray for those who have a job but that feel they want to move. Father, I pray that you'll clearly show them if their job is done where they are, Lord, in Jesus' name. And if they still have something to do there, Lord, I pray that you'll reveal it to them. And that they'll be able to see the higher calling. That things will st start to fall in place for them to be able to live out that calling. Father, for those that you need to move or for those that you need to, to provide a work for, Father, we ask that your kingdom will come. We are seeking your kingdom first. Father, I pray that you will place each person 
divinely in a position and in a place of influence at work in the right company to bring your kingdom there. Father, you know where there's open doors. I pray for a man of peace on the inside of those companies to receive and accept them and to help them to enhance the call that they have on their lives, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we wait expectantly, Father, to see what you are going to do within a short time to start to place people where you want to shift companies, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Then I want to do one more thing. Was Benny? Benny, I shall arrange my doy handout. Okay. So this morning while we were praying, I believed God showed me that there's a special grace for salvation this morning. But the salvation goes beyond these walls. We are going to stand proxy for people who need to get to know Jesus this morning in this place. Benny is handing out a little prayer request card. So as an act of faith, I'm going to ask you to write the name of somebody that you are trusting God for, for salvation specifically, to write that down. Maybe they know God, but they've gotten distracted. They've gotten pulled in by the world again. And we need to call them back to God's kingdom. So you can write that name on as well. I'm going to pray in a moment that God will show you who we are praying for. But I believe there's a special grace for salvation this morning. We have some families that we've been so blessed with God's presence here. And now the enemy is going after their family with sicknesses and, and trouble in their families. If the devil wants to go after our families, we will go after our families with salvation. We will counter, we will raise a standard against them, and we will start to pray for salvation. All right. Okay, does everybody have a card? Still need one here? All right. Let's pray. Father God, you know... And every person by name and you call them by name so father i pray that you will reveal to us people that we can put our faith out for salvation and father as we as we see those people as we think about those people father we are going to write their name on that card and father this is our act of faith our prophetic act of faith to write those names down Thank you, Father, that you show us who these people are. I want to end off with this last scripture, just as an encouragement to you. And that's in the book of Haggai, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 5 to 9, where he says, And I will shake all nations, and desire, and the precious things of all, this na of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And then this last scripture that says, The latter glory of this house, with its successor to which Jesus came, shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace and prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. So may the, may the glory of the latter be greater. And that's what Jesus said. We're going to do greater things than he did because of com community, because we can do it together. We've got a much greater impact. So saints, go. Take your cloud of glory and go change the world in Jesus' name.